Cairo, Seattle. It's time to get schooled with a professor, John Clayton. Welcome to Schooled with a Professor. I'm John Clayton, and the topic is the third preseason game. And you know that's a big one because the Seattle Seahawks take on the Dallas Cowboys on a Thursday night, a game that uh, you know should draw some interest. But I think what you're looking at is at some point there probably needs to be an adjustment and a change. From the National Football League owner's standpoint, you know they'd love to be able to turn two preseason games into two regular season games and say, hey, we keep the package at 20, we keep the same time period, but you know players are not going to go for it, particularly with this union that's currently there, and I think wisely so, because, I mean, I chart the injuries. I see the injuries, and of course, even though injuries went down last year, if you put 18 regular season games, you know the devastating amount of injuries is just going to be way too much. It'd be great to be able to do economically. It'd be phenomenal because I mean it would be able to get you know more money coming from television and all those things. But in the end, it's not going to happen. But you know I go back covering in the 1970s, and at that time there was six preseason games count them six and I remember a time that I actually covered seven when I was covering the Steelers because they had what was known as a college all-star game where you would go to Chicago Soldier Field they would take the top college players that year put them up in a game against the uh, you know a a team like the Pittsburgh Steelers actually it was pretty much against a Super Bowl team and try to see how that was going to go seven preseason games I mean training camp went forever and it was a different time I mean you had two a days you had long practices you had long days. I mean, everybody was in pads. I mean, it was just a brutal long period of time, and it seemed like it took forever just to get to the regular season. You know, somehow, some way, I don't know how players did it back then. You know, rosters weren't 53. They were, lot, they were less. And, you know, it didn't seem as though players were injured as much as they are now, and maybe that's because the bodies weren't as big. I mean, in some ways, what you do was that you had training camp, and guys came into camp just to get in shape. I mean, they didn't train like they do year round now. You know, they don't have all the equipment, all the things that were there now that were back. That wasn't there back then. I mean, this was a different time. And of course, uh, I mean, heck, there were some players that you know had to almost have second jobs to be able to uh, you know finance themselves because salaries were so low. I mean, TV was just really beginning its boom. It wasn't there yet, and so you know the contracts for TV were flat. The salaries were low. Now salaries have escalated to a point where, I mean, you're now getting players retiring, even though they might have three or four more years of football left in their system. Different time, different place. But, you know, the thought was, okay, in 1978, they went from 14 regular season games to 16, and that took the preseason from six to four. Now, you still have the Hall of Fame game. There was a couple other little spray games that they would put in there, and that seemed to move things a little bit faster. Now, in 2011, when the collective bargaining agreement was trying to be negotiated and the union was at war with the uh, owners and the owners locked out the players, and so things were there, I mean, the thought was they were trying to push them into a way to go with the 18-game regular season schedule. But, you know, players did their study. They realized the injuries. They realized the toll in their body. All those things worked against trying to be able to do it, and it didn't happen. And so, uh, and you can understand it. It's just way too long. But when you're looking at the preseason games, and there's, I think, a lot more people thinking that, can there be a way to shorten it from four to three? Roger Goodell is not a fan of the preseason. He cares about the product. He is a commissioner that, uh, you know, cares about integrity, but he also wants to make sure that he has the best foot forward what's out there, and he's not seeing it in the preseason. I mean, you've seen even more so this season, more starting quarterbacks just sitting out, you know, whether it was going to be uh, an Aaron Rodgers. You know, Tom Brady has, you know, not been as active. Now, of course, part of it was he had the silliest injury last week in the sense that he was trying to clean his cleats with a purist scissors and cut his thumb on his left hand and so he was not able to go so that kind of a, a weird one but uh one that uh you can see but it's like yeah there's the the intensity just doesn't seem to be there you know you certainly get a lot of benefits from the coaches i mean they get to go out there and you start to see like for for example these preseason games may have more importance for seattle than say a team like arizona 
Why is that? Well, I mean, from Seattle's standpoint, they're trying to put together an offensive line on the fly. Five new guys that are in new positions or new players on the offensive line, and they need to go out there for a quarter or two quarters, now probably into the third quarter, to see where they stand, make the adjustments, and then see where they are. So there's probably, but other teams, they're not going to be as concerned about things because they're pretty well set. New England, for example, there's not a lot. I mean, you want to accomplish as much as you can, but it's not going to be there. So by cutting it down to three, because you know how it's going to be next week. Next week's fourth preseason where starters are not going to be out there can be brutal. I know that even at times the commissioners kind of put a little uh, edict out, hey, come on, play your guys. Uh, I remember you would pick up a coach like Mike Shanahan, and he wouldn't. I mean, he would just take as many starters as possible, could stretch you know, 18 to 20 starters going from the 75-man roster that would be there. And I'm sure at some point they'll probably narrow it down just to one cut, and that would be so easy if you would take it to three preseason games because then after that third preseason game, you have a big, long, extra bye week that now you can start to you know get prepared for the season. I mean, you then take the roster from 90 to 53, but you know you don't have to rush as much. I mean, you probably put the Tuesday after that third preseason game, and then have the cut, and that gives you a little bit of extra time to to rest up and see where you are, and then get ready for the regular season. A couple things would have to happen if indeed you are cutting the third preseason game. Now, first off, they have to make up the revenue. You know owners care about that. And I kind of go by the model. Let's say the average ticket price is $100 and you get 60000 So that's a $6 million gate. Well, if you can find a way to expand the playoffs and make up all that money, then, you know, that might be economically better and better on the wear and tear of the players. It would be better on the quality of the game. I think those things are there. The other thing you would have to do if you're going to be a coach is schedule more dual practices where you go to another place or have a team that will come to your place and just have those practices. I mean, I, I've really, I mean, since about 1998, I've been going on training camp tours, and one of the things I try to structure everything around is seeing dual practices. I learned more from watching a huge, Houston, San Francisco dual practice or a Jacksonville, Tampa Bay dual practice than I did maybe in some of the preseason games. Because then, I mean, you know, there is no pulling out the starters. I mean, you just go first team against first team, second team against second team. You go on a regular rotation, and then you can judge things. I, I go back to last week. I watched uh, Tampa Bay and Jacksonville, and what I thought were two teams on a parallel track to getting better. You know, they had two good offensive years. Then they are now in the process trying to fix up their defense, and uh, that may be a two-year process. I came out thinking, you know, I don't know if Jacksonville is going to have a winning season, but they're about a year ahead of Tampa Bay on that defensive rebuilding because they picked up speed. But I was able to watch that because the starters, there's not going to be any sitting out. They just go through the regular rotation. So from the coaching standpoint, you may get more out of these dual practices. Also, you may get less injuries out of these dual practices. So you can almost treat it like... You know, for example, Denver, I think they've done two sessions. San Francisco has done two sessions. You can almost get the equivalent of five looks at a team against another team with uh, that and learn more and get less players hurt because, I mean, the tempo is going to be different in one of those dual practices because you're really not going live, but you're going against other guys, and you're going to have fights, and you're going to have problems. You're going to get a few injuries and stuff like that, but not to the extent that you will in the preseason game. So that may be one way the coaches can make up for it, and you can get good judgments of how some of your younger players fit compared to some of your other players on the team. That may be the answer. So I think, you know, would they consider it? Now, again, it's convincing the owners that they can replace the revenue and be able to do it. But from the professional standpoint, I think it's time because, I mean, you look and see, let's say that you you bench 20 starters. Well, I mean, you know, you've got uh, in that fourth preseason game, all you're doing is exposing guys who aren't going to make the team to injury. Now, understand the injury system and how it works in the NFL. Base salaries for rookies, $450,000. If they go on injured reserve, that number comes down to 333000 But if you're like the Seahawks and get, you know, six, seven guys out there, that's 2 to $3 million out of your cap, and it puts you at a strain. So you want to try to maybe see if you can minimize that, because I've seen it. I mean, I think, remember, one year the New England Patriots had a fourth pre- or had a fourth preseason game and they had like five six injuries I mean it destroys you so you really can't do that but and you know but right now there's no way out of it so 
ultimately what they need to do is be able to uh, think about getting down to three. I hope it's sooner rather than later. Hey, we all love football. Football is fantastic. And any chance you get to watch a football game is great. But what you don't want to see is some bad football, even though it's still fun to watch. You pick up little things and all that. But, you know, I think ultimately as we go into this third preseason game for Seattle, I mean, this is the best of the three. This is where you get to see Ezekiel Elliott go against the Seahawk run defense. This is where you get to see, you know, where does Dallas Cowboys defensive line match up against Seattle's offensive line? That you get to see. What you would really rather see is maybe one extra, one less preseason game and pay for one less preseason game and then try to see if you can just get ready better for the regular season. Welcome back to Schooled with a Professor. The topic for this week's podcast is preseason football. And the idea is Seahawks play the Dallas Cowboys, a Thursday night game. It's the third game of the preseason, the most important game. And, of course, what has to happen is that uh, you get to play the starters more. But the question is, is the preseason too long? Can it be shortened? And joining us right now is Paul Moyer. And, Paul, I mean, you came in at a time, and, of course, I go back back into the early 70s because there was a six-game preseason because at that time it was 14 regular season games and six. And then in 78, they switched it around and then went 16 and four. But are you getting the feeling now that four is unnecessary or is it too much because you just see a drop-off after week three with almost a meaningless fourth preseason game? Yeah, I I agree. And, And, you know, Back in the 70s, a lot of people think I played in six preseason games. I did not. I only had four. Um, you know, you were trying to get in shape. It, it was different. Um, you know, teams, you know, you know, this is year-round, and, and they train and prepare for, for the season going into it. So you don't need four preseason games and two-a-days like we used to have to, to do the things to get the guys in shape. I, I think it's for sure one game too long. Um I'm not sure how you cut it down less than that, you know, to, to two games because I don't know how you would evaluate the younger players unless they went in and did something and said, hey, we're going to expand the rosters. We're going to have more scrimmage type games uh, for the, you know, first year players and, and rookies. Um, but I, I feel like this, it is weird because I was talking to a friend today going, this feels like this should be the last preseason game. I'm ready for the regular season to start, and I think the players are. I know the coaches are. So, you know, one for sure, you know more of the economics than I do, John, but as far as players being ready and prepared to go, uh, I think, you know, three max is all you need. Now, of course, you can look at it a different way because, I mean, you were a player, and you also coached. And so you can look at it from the player standpoint. And, of course, I'm sure as a player you go, oh, boy, another preseason game. But, well, of course, you know, for you being a starter, you wouldn't play probably in that fourth preseason game. And particularly as time is going on now, you see less and less in that fourth preseason game. And from the coach's standpoint, you do want to see more. How do you try to balance that? Well, I think, you know, you, you adapt. You know, certainly as a, as a coach, you want more games and you want more practices, but that just means you're implementing more things. Uh, and then once you learn to adapt, you you do more of it in the film room, you do more walkthrough things and, and you just become more efficient, you know, with the time you have on the field. And they, and look, we've seen it. They've adapted. You know, the game is still pretty strong. Um, you know, as a player, it, it's, to me, it's really about the backups. You know, this isn't like preseason or training camp for baseball where, you're going to get plenty of reps to prove yourself. Um, you're going to have to do it on the practice field. And, you know, the, the times you get in the, the game, you're just going to have to make the most impact you can. But uh, you know what? What is different, again, though, is you got a practice squad now. So you can show some type of, you know, opportunity, I guess, or where they're looking at you saying, you know, that's a, a potential guy. We can put him on the practice squad. He can prove himself. And we can bring him now – during the regular season. So again, I just think it's something you, you, you adopt or adapt to and, you know, players are going to figure it out, but I think everybody fans, you know, the starters for sure. Um, the media, uh, it, it's four preseason games. They're, they're just boring. You know I mean? I, I, I love football, but you know, I, they're, they're boring to go to watch preseason football games, particularly when you get in the second half. Oh yeah. And I, I know from my standpoint is listen, I love this game. 
have loved it from, from the very beginning. I'm so fortunate to be able to be involved in it. And this preseason seems to me to be even less interesting. And I'm not talking about the decisions. I mean, the preseason and the practices. I mean, I get more out of going to practices, seeing practices and other teams than I necessarily see in the preseason games. Because, number one, I mean, you don't see any strategy. What you do see when you're at a practice is that you can go around and ask questions and how this guy's doing, and you can see so much more. And if you have a scrimmage, like I went to Jacksonville, Tampa Bay, you see more in the scrimmages than you necessarily do in the preseason games. And that's because, again, what you see is the starters out there, for the most part, longer in the practices than in the games. Yeah, and I think the point you brought up there, too, is I think you would and you would see more scrimmages versus other teams. Uh, you know, it's one way that you can get your, your scrimmages in without, you know, putting too much wear and tear on, on your own players. Um, because again, I don't know how you evaluate the other guys if you don't get, you know, some type of game atmosphere. And that's it. It's the only thing I would see drop off a little bit. And, you know, you go back to the seventies and eighties, there were scrimmages. I remember we used to scrimmage, you know, the Houston Oilers and, uh, you know, just you know, usually that's because training camp started about three weeks before the first preseason game. So you get, you know, a little bit of live play there. Uh, but look, like, I just I think with the economics of the game, you know, the injuries that they're so afraid of going into regular season, you know, it, it's crazy not to to cut one of these preseason games and, and maybe two. I, I you know, two, why not just have two? You know, it, in college football, I guess that's the best analogy or example I can give. You don't see them having any practice games. You know, they 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 get ready with the guys they have. They they adapt, figure it out. And I think the NFL could certainly, you know, they could figure it out, too. We're just so accustomed to tradition of having these preseason games. Well, the one thing I know with the uh, idea, Commissioner Paul, I mean, Commissioner uh, Roger Goodell is not a big fan of the preseason. He would love to be able to shorten it. And of course, he would love to be able to replace two preseason games with two regular season games. But, you know, putting on your player's hat. You don't see that happening because of injuries, and you know that that drain on the season for 18 regular season games, particularly with the current CBA and the current union, that's not going to happen. But if there was the revenue equity to be able to take it down to three and maybe two, I think Goodell would go for it. So why couldn't they? Because it's it's not so much you losing ticket prices, right, in mm. in a preseason game. They they sell them. You know, they're not quite max price, but pretty close. But, you know, that's that's a drop in the bucket, the ticket price. And what they're making off of preseason TV, same thing. Why can't you extend the football season 18 weeks? But you play, you know, 16 games. You just give teams, you know, one to two or two buys. You know, you're you're going to have TV, you know, every weekend. And that's what people really care about. You know, can't they make that up from a from an economic standpoint? They might, but what it does, and I know this from trying to figure out games to cover during the season when they have, say, as many as six uh, teams on bye weeks, it's hard to find good Sunday afternoon games. And so all of a sudden, yeah. you water down the CBS and Fox product to a point where, you know, they get bad games and potentially bad ratings. Like, say, for example, uh, you have both the Seahawks and Arizona Cardinals out of the, you know, taking a bye week, an extra bye week. Now all of a sudden you're looking there and saying, now wait a second, two of the best teams in the NFC or the two best teams you're not going to see for a couple weeks. And so that's where the problem entails. It's like, yeah, it's easy to do and you can stretch it out and get that extra week, but then you do water down the Sunday product. And believe me, there's times where I look and I say, I don't know what game to go to because, you know, some of them are so thin. <laughs> Yeah, no, well, you got the Thursday night games, you got, you know, Sunday night games, you got, yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a lot of games spread out, and, you know, all of a sudden, your your marquee, you know, Sunday afternoon games, you are, it gets, there are times I look, I go, is there only two games playing in the morning, or the afternoon, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's the Oakland Raiders in San Diego? You know, I don't want to watch that game. Yeah, and then so, and then you add the you international know. flavor because I mean they're going to be up eventually. They're going to keep adding international games, and so those games may be on you know well before the time, which is great because then you get a triple header during the day, but then you get less product for CBS and Fox. And you know when you're paying over a billion dollars a year, you want to still be able to maximize their ratings. Yeah, you know the one thing I know is that they'll figure it out. And yeah. at the end of the day, I think you know keeping players. 
you know, for the regular season is going to be more important than that extra preseason game. And look, it only takes really one game, two max for, for, you know, the NFL guys to get ready. Uh, it's again, to me, it's a more an evaluation process. I think you just do some scrimmages, you know, with the vet or one year player guys, you're, you know, you're, are, are fighting for a starting spot. And I think that would uh, at least solve some of the problems. Yeah, and I'm, honestly, what I think what it'll come down to is when they expand, and I say when, the uh, playoff package. You know, for example, yeah. you know what you're talking about, if you take away two preseason games, or just say, let's say you take away one. Let's, let's say you have a $100 ticket and you get 60,000 fans. That's $6 million. Well, you can replace that because, man, you get 60% of it and 40% when you're on the road with more money coming in. And so if you can do that, so if they expand it, you know, say to 14 and maybe 16 uh, teams in the playoffs, that might be the answer to be able to at least replace some of the revenue and take it down to three preseason games. Because the one thing you know about the owners, they like to own the money and not give it back. Oh, that the playoffs would definitely replace the preseason money. I mean, there's there's no question. I'm actually shocked so many people show up for preseason games. You know, I, I you know if they stop showing up, uh, I know they they come because you have to buy those tickets. So it, it forces them a little bit. But you know, if all of a sudden there's there's just no one in the stands, um, you know that that'll force their hand as well. But you know, you go and look at last week's game, and I might imagine you know tomorrow's game, you know, with or the, the Dallas. Seahawks game coming up. Uh, shoot, are you kidding me? That thing's going to be packed, and mm-hmm. it's, it's going to look like everybody's okay with still with preseason games. Yeah, but I know that, like for example, go back to that Kansas City opener for the Seahawks. I mean, you know, cheap fans love it. I mean, they t- they basically have great tailgate parties. They you know enjoy being around each other. I mean, that, they had a lot of empty seats in that game. And that surprised me, but I guess in some ways it doesn't surprise me. And again, I look at these preseason games, and it just they just seem to be so watered down this year. Yep, the the, the last the, the third preseason one's the the one that people get a little bit excited about. You know, where you go, okay, I'm I'm excited to watch this, and I'm excited to watch the Seahawks. You know, and you know they've got some a lot of question marks. Some of them where I'm extremely positive about. Others and I'm like, you know what? We, we they got to step up a little bit. Uh, so I'm excited about this dress rehearsal against a, a, a good Cowboy team coming up Thursday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and of course, uh, how much? Because you know, it's funny in that last preseason game, that fourth one. I mean, they all play them on a Thursday pretty much, and all of a sudden they're trying to get through that game as fast as humanly possible and without getting injuries. And then the problem is you do get injuries, and all of a sudden it puts you at a cap at disadvantage because now you're carrying all these injured players that you normally wouldn't have. Yeah, it is weird when you, again when you look at college because they don't do it. You know, their they their first game is their first game. You know, and and it's pretty good pretty good product. No one complains about the product there. Uh, so you know, there's look, there's so much money on the line. You know, something is going to change. Uh, they've done a lot. I mean, it, I'm shocked there's actually injuries nowadays because as you know, when you go to training camp practice, it truly is. It, it's club med. It is a it's a fun atmosphere. I mean, they got great facilities. There, no one's pounding on each other. Uh, they've got sports science people there. They've got nutritionalists. They've got recovery drinks. They've got massage guys ready to go. I'm shocked anybody gets injured at practice. Um, so <laughs> they, they they keep getting better at this thing. And um, you know, I think the game while it's going to change, everybody says, "Oh, it's not going to be better." I said, "You know, it's just going to be different." Um, but you know what? It's still going to be a game that everybody loves, and I don't see the excitement and the popularity uh, dwindling anytime soon. Well, I think we've solved the problem of cutting it down to you know three preseason games. I don't know if they'll go to two. If we can do that, we just have to come up with the money, so maybe we'll start taking a collection so in the future we'd be able to make sure there's only three preseason games and not four. Hey, Paul, thanks hey, for joining us. Well, they don't get mine. Well, you're not paying? My money. Oh, okay. No, they don't get my money. I'm not, my contract stays the same. Okay. No, you're, you're good. All right. You're good. Hey, thank okay. you so much. everyone it's time to ask the professor what are you yapping about
Welcome back to Schooled with the Professor. As we do every week, using the hashtag Clayton Schooled, we take a question from the Twitter sphere. This week, the question is, how much will injury prevention play into decisions to shorten the preseason? I think a lot of it, because, you know, I know the cap keeps going up $10 million plus a year. It gives a little bit more leverage. But, you know, here's what's happening in the front offices now. There's such a fear because of injuries. And what happens is that, you know, guys that aren't going to make the team do get hurt. I mean, those are the guys that are usually signed after the first wave of undrafted free agents that go to teams, and they get contracts that are basically three-year deals at the minimum salary, and the minimum salary for rookies are four hundred and fifty, five hundred and forty, and six hundred and thirty thousand dollars this year. Next year it'll go up like about fifteen thousand dollars. All right, so when you get an injury and you try to say, okay, you now have to figure out how that's going to work into your accounting because you know you put them on a waived injured. And then what you hope to do is be able to find some settlement. But if you notice, I mean, everybody that gets waived injured, you have to wait and wait and wait until they're healthy to get cleared. And so sometimes you may have to pay them five weeks, six weeks or seven weeks. But if you can't reach a deal and you can't come to any understanding as far as the timetable it's going to take, you know, you take, uh, you know, Seattle, they've got more than $3 million currently tied up in players that were waived injured and they haven't reached injury settlements yet. Now, you know, the uh, and so what teams do is that they now figure and you see all this big cap room. I mean, San Francisco has forty nine million dollars of the cap. Seahawks currently at eight point nine million dollars. But what you have to almost do is put aside eight to ten million dollars of your cap for injuries and your draft choices. And, you know, again, when you figure that, you know, you're not just going to have those rookies that are going to get hurt. You have other guys, the second year guys at three hundred and forty eight thousand dollars. Other guys are going to have their full salaries at six hundred thousand dollars. You know, Mohamed Cisse, for example, he was waived injured. And I think that's about a six hundred thousand dollar bite into your cap unless there's some kind of a settlement. And so that, that all adds up to three, four million dollars. And that doesn't count the rip replacement cost because then you have to get a player to come in here either at the minimum or more to fill in for that roster spot so you can have 53 active players. So it's a big bite into your budget. And so because of that, you have to be more cautious and you don't want to risk players to injuries. And so when in doubt, you leave them out. That's what teams do. And so it's not as if you get total protection because, again, you know, the older the player is, the bigger cap number is going to be and the bigger biggest cost is going to be to your team. You know, teams, you know, with enough cap room, I mean, they don't mind paying the salaries, but what they care about is paying the cap. And some years you're going to be, you know, very tight against the cap. I mean, you go back last year, I honestly don't know how the Seahawks made it through other than the brilliance of Matt Thomas, their cap guy, in being able to figure, okay, well, I mean, well, we can get by with each week. And they ended up with like $11,000 of cap room left at the end of the year. So it's a cap issue. It's one where the injuries, you have to kind of do as much of a preventive way as possible. And, you know, science is coming into this now. I mean, each team has their own science structure and have all these different things. I mean, for example, they put uh, little chips on shoulder pads to see, you know, if a player is starting to fatigue, you know, they have other different chips that, you know, test the heart rates of players, you know, those things. And so that is helping. But the problem is on the football field and in games, you still have the collisions and all that. You know, one thing that's going to be big this year and it's going to be for the next couple of years is, you know, putting these mile per hour chips to see, you know, if a player starts to wear down a little bit faster. I mean, you judge his speed in what he's able to do. But if you see, for example, an offensive lineman who's starting to pull to one side and his speed starts to go down, then it's like, oh, we better start thinking about taking him out. You know, example, I know when you look in the uh, NBA, uh, you can have a big center like Garnett when he was in Boston. What they did with Garnett, they saw and they put the tracker on him, and they noticed that after about five to seven minutes in a game, his speed dropped dramatically. So what did they do? They would take him out every five to seven minutes, refresh him. He came back and had two really good years because and extended his career because they realized, oh, he doesn't have the stamina to be able to go for an entire quarter, but if we take chunks away and do that, you know, we can get him to play better. He stayed healthier, and it worked out that much better. 
you'll be able to see that in the National Football League. So there are more scientific ways to be able to watch for injuries. There's more ways that you can see the studies are going to do, and that'll help things out. But in the end, it's big body going against big body in a collision sport. And so you can try to prevent it, but you can't stop it. That's it for this week's edition of Schooled. You can follow me on Twitter at Clayton ESPN and send me your NFL questions with hashtag Clayton Schooled for a chance to get your questions on the air and on the podcast. If you have a minute, please let's have a review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. Class dismissed.